Welcome back to Recalculating, the program dedicated to American small business. My co-host, Dan Perkins, is on assignment. But we have with us today, Mark Moyer. Uh, He's a business growth strategist, and he's here to talk about ways to grow your small business. Mark, welcome to the program. Uh, Hello, Don. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Mark, tell us a little bit about your background. Absolutely. Uh, The short version, and I always say there's no such thing as a short version, but uh, I spent the, the bulk of my career has been helping companies hire the right people as an executive recruiter. And as time went on, I realized that actually individuals, especially entrepreneurs and uh, executives, needed some advice on how to grow their careers and their businesses. And about 10 years or so ago, I started my own firm where I've been coaching uh, entrepreneurs and business owners into how to really not just grow their business, but how to be seen in a, a more positive light and how to increase their visibility and traction in the marketplace. Well, you know, we're in a, an expanding economy. We're in a time where prior to the election of President Trump, whatever you think about him, uh, we were uh, in a period of stagnant growth. Now we're in a period of uh, large growth. I just saw across my um, uh, desk today uh, that there were, were – Seven million uh, job openings in the United States today hasn't been that many uh, for 40 years. Anyway, um, still takes a lot to uh, grow a business. What are some of the things you've learned that you uh, would like to part to our audience? One thing I see in this market, especially, is that many entrepreneurs have wonderful ideas and they try to get a company started. They bootstrap it sometimes, or they get investors. And then they try to bring in some people to get it up and running. Uh, What they lack in oftentimes is execution because they're so focused on their own idea and how to get their own message out that they don't necessarily focus on, well, what does the audience really want? What does the potential customer or client really want or need? And how can they address that need? How can they scratch that itch? How can they be the cure to uh, to their common cold? And one of the things that I like to always talk about is 24-7, always put yourself in the eyes and the mind and the shoes of the person you are trying to interact with or you are interacting with and try to anticipate what is it that, that that's going to compel them to want to either do business with you or listen to you or get to your desired outcome. That's, that's good advice. I see a lot of times um... – entrepreneurs who are in the, on this program or we uh, talk with, that they, they seem to be in love with their product more than with their customer. What do you say to that? <laughs> I say that you are 100% correct. The uh, a majority of the people I speak with fall into that category. They are so convinced that their product is the answer, but they don't actually find out, well, what's the, actual, what's the question that they're answering? Who is it that's out there that really needs that product? And I think sometimes, uh, whether it's a product or service, there's so much of a focus of trying to please everybody. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, you need to start with a fairly narrow niche and really try to establish credibility and excellence in that niche, and then you can grow from there. And I think sometimes people have more of a shotgun approach instead of a rifle approach. I, I couldn't agree with you more. That's one thing. I'm going to, since we have a little time, give us another suggestion you have for, uh, when you're coaching uh, small business owners. One of them is one thing I like to ask people to do is to effectively try to survey their audience. And I don't necessarily mean by sending, you know, here's a survey, please answer these questions. But maybe more so, it can be uh, whether it's a direct email to your potential client base where you're simply asking, If I was to do blank, is this something you would have an interest in? Or uh, if I was to do one of the following four things going forward, which would interest you the most? And what you find is that when you ask people, when you're putting your potential product out there, but you're asking them about the different types of service or product you're going to offer, a lot of times you'll be absolutely surprised at what you find out when the results come back in. And that that happens quite frequently with my clients where they are absolutely shocked to see that 
a big percentage of people are actually leaning one, much more one direction than expected. And, and one of the other things I really like to talk about is that this is all, when you have a new business and a new venture, you have to really be malleable. You have to really learn to have a Teflon skin and almost go with the flow. Uh, and it's happened in my own business where originally I was focusing almost all of my time on helping people with their careers and guiding them from conceptually the couch uh, to the to the boardroom. And as much as I've enjoyed that and it's been great, I've also realized that I've evolved much more towards business coaching and helping people's businesses and not just um, – not just getting them up and running, but really sustaining them. And that's the, that's the big thing. It's one thing to get them up and running. It's another thing to have sustained growth. And that's something that I've transitioned. So I think it's, to me, it's, it's really important for a new business or a new, uh, you know, an entrepreneur to be flexible with, you know, with their end game. Well, we're talking with Mark, Mark Moyer. Mark, what's your website for our audience? It's a pretty easy one, markmoyer.com. M A R K M O Y E R dot com, and and a funny story about that is that when I tried to get that website initially, I found out that somebody else owned it, and I said, well, "How is that possible that somebody else would own this website?" Turns out there was another Mark Moyer out in Phoenix, Arizona, who uh, just bought it many many years ago and said, "Oh, someday I'm going to have a blog." So we ended up basically negotiating over the ability to have that website. So I. I finally got a hold of it, uh, you know, three or four years ago, and and so that's where all of my information resides. I've got information about my coaching services, my podcast, my book, uh, a variety of things. So it's a it's a great resource. Uh, and your book, what's the name of it? The book is called Win Again, and I wrote Win Again uh, just uh, just released it several months ago. Uh, it's a basically a job search playbook helping athletes transition into the workforce because one of the one of the people that I'd been coaching was a retired hockey player and a professional hockey player and he really struggled with leaving the game and making that transition into what he was going to do post career and when I spoke to him he had already been out 10 years and he'd been he had been day trading basically for the past 7 years and he was at home with his wife, his kids, and he was demoralized and depressed and really didn't know what he was going to do with the rest of his life and his career, and he was still young. And once we started chatting and I encouraged him to you know, become a better networker, but to also be on LinkedIn and to start reaching out to people and start making more connections, and then from there, leverage those connections into meetings that eventually led to a couple of interviews and an offer. And he went from our first conversation to five weeks later having an offer at a financial services firm that he accepted and he was amazed at the speed and I said when you do things a certain way and you tie in a lot of networking and uh, being uh, proactive in your job search things can happen very quickly and he said to me Mark you need to really focus on athletes because they really really struggle when they get, leave the game and I mean we're not talking about Derek Jeter or you know, um, or Magic Johnson, but more so the 90% of other athletes that may make a fair amount of money at one point, but it, it goes away. And they're left, and they're, they retire at a young age, you know, in their 20s, maybe 30s. So I wrote the book with the idea of helping these athletes make that transition. Because, for one, I went onto Amazon, and I noticed that there were no books written at all about helping athletes make that transition. There are a couple of books written about the Fran Tarkenton story, how I, you know, took, you know, went from here to running, uh, doing real estate. And then there was the John Elway story and how he left the game and opened up a bunch of car dealerships. But there weren't any written by career experts on how to get the athletes to use their skill set capabilities and their, and what they've been trained in and leveraging that into a career. So I, I, it's a, it's a book that's basically thousands of dollars of coaching in a $20 book is what I tell people. And it's uh, actionable tips and strategies that you can immediately use. And I find that a lot of the books that are out there today, they, they lack actual stuff you can use right away. It's usually an upsell to their coaching or their conferences and whatnot. But I decided 
I wanted my book to be helpful from the uh, first page on. And the name of the book again? Is Win Again. Uh, we're talking with Mark Moyer. His website is mark, markmoyer.com. But now, uh, uh, Mark, you said something interesting. You said you ought to be flexible. Yet, uh, if you uh, uh, look at many of these uh, uh, stories of successful uh, entrepreneurs, it's they, they did it their way. Um, Steve Jobs being uh, one, uh, uh, he clearly did it his way. But uh, you're saying that you have to be flexible. How do you reconcile those two thoughts? Well, my guess is that Steve Jobs at some point along the way received feedback from potential customers suggesting that maybe the uh, the keyboard should look a little bit more like this than like that, and uh, or that when it came time to develop an iPhone, uh, he you know it was he was originally going to have a round one and it turned out to a rectangle. I'm not sure, but I think what happens is that as much as we may think as entrepreneurs that we have brilliant ideas that have never been thought of before, which is always untrue. Everything seems to have been thought of. It's just a question of actually executing on it. But I think that what happens is that um, the ones that tend to suffer are the ones that push a product so hard without really looking at what the client or the potential customer needs and wants and what's going to really create market share. And so you need to be flexible in that if something is not working, you need to pivot. If you don't pivot, you're toast. (laughs) The way it goes. You know, it's interesting. Just today, a, a, a company uh, went belly up. Uh, what it did is provided kitchens where uh, food entrepreneurs could uh, develop their products and uh, create batch runs, etc. And they just went belly up. They closed the doors quite suddenly. But um, uh, and, and what what happened was that the uh, the two founders. Um, uh, stuck to their model too long rather than make the adjustments that everybody said was necessary. So uh, there, there's a, a, a verification of what you're saying. But it's often difficult to get an entrepreneur to change. Uh, how do you get them to change? I think it's important to, to reverse engineer the process a little bit and to Ask them, well, where do you really want this to go? What's the end game or the, the next level? Are you trying to do this so that another company can swoop in in three or four years and buy you? Are you looking to do this to basically run it the rest of your life and your career? Is this just a hobby for you? What is the actual goal here? And But start with the you know, vision 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, are you thinking about, you know, 10 years from now, is your yacht going to be named after your company? Or is it going to be where you're in a basement somewhere still grinding away? Well, you don't have that vision. You'd probably rather the yacht vision. Well, how do you get to that point? Well, go backwards from there and and really try to think, well, how do I get there? How, what, you know, what are the steps necessary to get there? But if you go backwards from there, I think you'll find out that you, you may say, well, look, if your audience, if, you're, if your customer base is telling you that, um, I don't know, triangle uh, lampshades are not the answer to put on top of this halogen light, you need to have circular ones, well, then you're going to need to learn to pivot. And I think that when you, when you put it in the way that, that it's not a bad idea what they're doing, but if the audience suggests something else, then they're going to be more more attuned to uh, making that transition. I think that, um, yes, we can be very stubborn at times, entrepreneurs and small business owners, and we, we often think that our way is the right way, but the landscape is littered with people that have stuck to their guns, as you said, and it's, uh, you know, I think there's enough evidence out there that shows that if you pivot, you'll you'll make it much bigger than if you don't. You said uh, you have several others. Let's go and give us another uh, ex- example of, of what you recommend. I think one of the critical things to do when you're running a business, it's important to surround yourself with smarter people. I don't really know necessarily what constitutes smarter, but I think it's important to have other people that are experts at what they're experts at, to have access to people like that. This way, for example, if I want a greater presence on social media, 
I know I'm not the right person for that. So what I've done is I've gone out and found someone else that, and she's absolutely amazing and knows how to do all kinds of uh, social media outreach and content, et cetera. If I want to hire someone to run my podcast, I mean, I've, I've gone out and found someone who really knows how to do these things. He's an expert. I'm not. I can speak pretty well, so I can be a podcaster, but I can't possibly do that. For, for when I wrote the book, I know I'm a very good writer, but I'm not, I'm not good enough to write, pull off the book myself. And I hired an editor to do that. So I think it's very important along the way to understand and realize that as smart as you may think you are, you're not the smartest. Uh, certainly at a lot of things that you need to have done. So that's a big, very important thing to do. It doesn't mean you need to hire a full team of people to surround you uh, 24-7. But certainly understand that your time is best spent maximizing what you're very good at and understand that other people are, are experts at other things and delegating that to the experts. There's a great book that I, I loved reading uh, three or four years ago uh, by a guy named Perry Marshall. And he's, he's one, of the, uh, you know, a very, one of the top business guys out there uh, in terms of uh, advice on, on how to be a top sales and marketer and he's got his book is called the 80 20 sales and marketing um it's 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 a fascinating book that covers a, a wide range of of topics on how to maximize you know using using the pareto principle which basically says the 80 20 rule is in effect almost everywhere right it's you know 80 percent of your business comes from 20 percent of your clients 80 percent of traffic travel goes on 20 percent of the road there's there's all kinds of 80 20 rules everywhere 80 percent of your me- email is garbage right um or much higher than that. But what he also talks about is within that 20%, the 80-20 rule applies in there, and he says, look, 64% of your success is going to come from 4% of your clients. So what he likes to talk about is focusing, uh, sort of a, using a laser to focus in on those moments during the course of your day that you are actually maximizing your, your potential, your income potential, your business potential. So, for example, if I am making for argument's sake a thousand dollars in a day well it's likely that i'm making let's say eight hundred dollars in the course of a 45 minute period because i'm closing a deal with something or other but maybe there's six hours of my time that's really spent doing stuff that's only making me five or ten dollars an hour kind of it's just stuff to do that needs to support the business and he talks about, look, shove all that other stuff to somebody else to do. They're going to be experts at it. They'll do it at a much um, more effective and efficient rate. And that frees up time for you to focus on that $800, 45-minute segment and repeat those all day long. And that's going to uh, increase your income potential dramatically and your business. Uh, that's one of many things he talks about, which I, I think is a, it's a, one of my absolute favorite uh, business books to read. It's uh, one I highly recommend. You know, it's funny. That book gets more mentions on this show than any other book. Interesting. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's worth it. <laughs> you know? Well, we can't get him to come on the show, but uh, we sure plug his book. Yeah, maybe maybe if he knows how much his book is getting mentioned, we'll, uh, and we'll, we'll uh, drag him in. I'll, yeah. I'll see if I can chase him down for you. One of the things that I found out with uh, uh, even a tool like LinkedIn is that if you use that platform in a certain way, it's incredible the types of connections you can make with people and the level and the caliber of people that you can actually connect with and start doing business with. And I can safely say that in the past several months, I've made some incredible connections that I that led to other connections, led to others that and to so many opportunities that never would have happened otherwise. And my feeling is that without even knowing if Perry Marshall is on LinkedIn, but he might be kicking around on there somewhere, my feeling is that if, you know, one thing that I've gotten very comfortable with is making introductions to other people and establishing uh, much stronger networks. Because to me, the, the root of all strong business comes from having a really rock solid foundation and a strong, strong network. And to develop a strong network, you need to be comfortable with how you expand that network. And to me, uh, the vast, vast majority of people hate 
the concept of networking. Their, their thought is that networking means you walk into a room full of strangers, you start shaking lots of hands, you pass out business cards, you've got name tags on, and you have awkward discussions about something. And to me, networking is something you can do sitting in your PJs behind your, your screen where you can actually spend some time on LinkedIn connecting with people as long as you have a specific message that you want to say, a personalized message that compels people to want to come back to you. And then you start a conversation and discussion where at no, no point initially do you say what it is you're looking for, but instead you offer the other person your assistance, your help, your, your network, anything that they might find of value, and then you start the ball rolling. And that's created uh, in, you know, numeral, uh, innumerable uh, opportunities for me. And it's something that I find that the vast majority of the people that I coach really don't even scratch the surface of something that to me is very much low hanging fruit. You're absolutely right. We're talking with Mark Moyer. His website is markmoyer.com. Um, Mark, in the, we have a few minutes left. Uh, can you give us another example of some of your suggestions? So far, you've, you've uh, batting a thousand, so keep going. <laughs> I guess I, I can't bat over a thousand, can I? But I'll try. Uh, you know, one of the other things that I, I notice when I look at uh, a, uh, an entrepreneur's website uh, or their how they're trying to put themselves out there is they, they tend to say, um, here's what my company does, and we do this, and we do that, and we do all these different things, and this is what you know we're going to do for you, and that sort of thing. And what I find is that people will read all that stuff, but they'll say, well, I couldn't, you know, so what? I couldn't care less. They, they're, they're not really hitting a court. And what I like to see instead, and I'll give you a quick example. I, I gave a speech a, a couple of weeks ago to a, a health care provider, and their website is all about all the amazing things that their company has done since, you know, 1748 or whatever. And, and you know, people reading that, I don't think they care. But instead, if they were to say right off the top of the thing, it said, have you ever had issues with health care? Have you ever struggled trying to find a doctor in your neighborhood? Have you ever been put on hold for many, many minutes with no results. If that's you, I'd love to talk to you because we here at so-and-so company um, are changing all of that. Well, suddenly, I'm, they're talking to me. They're resonating to me as the reader, and I'm thinking, you know what? For once, here's a company I'd love to talk to. And the same goes for a business owner. Instead of saying all the different things that you do, talk about how you're going to cure their, their illness, their itch, their issue how you're going to solve their problem. For example, one of the people I'm helping out is actually a charity, and this charity basically brings kids out of the neighborhood, the bad neighborhoods, and onto the, a baseball diamond, and they basically provide baseball equipment and batting cages and all kinds of things. And I said, well, instead of talking about the charity and all, the, all these great things that you do, talk to, the, talk to the child, talk to the parent. Have you ever wished that your child, your son or daughter, could be on a baseball field instead of walking the streets in Philly or New York or wherever? Have you ever wanted to see the joy that they feel at the crack of the bat when they hit a home run? Donate to us and we'll put your child there or take advantage of our charities, blah, 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 blah. But it's, it's all about presenting it where you're, you're solving their issues, but you first address their issues first. And when people do that, they see the engagement increase dramatically. You know, you're absolutely right on that point. Whenever I go to a show, I'm always surprised. Number one, you you can never tell from the booth what what the the, the particular um, uh, provider does. And two, they never ask you what you need. They're always talking about what they can do. I'm, absolutely. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always surprised on it. Well, I'm no longer surprised. I'm just and we talk about it. Uh, let's talk about one other thing, follow-up, which is a favorite subject of mine. What do you tell people about follow-up? Well, follow-up, what I tell them is it's absolutely critical and essential. I can't tell you how many people say to me, well, Mark, I sent an email last week and I haven't heard back. What should I do? And I say, well, 
to email them again. What are you talking about? What do you do? Because I receive every day, you know, 100, 200 emails. And if anybody sends me an email and I can't get to it right away, it's, it goes all the way down my screen and it's gone. And I forget. But if somebody emails me again, uh, I mean, I may have a much better chance and even a third time. I'm not going to be upset with them that they're stalking me like that because, honestly, they're being persistent and I appreciate that. However, I also counsel people to never say, oh, I guess you didn't see my email last week, blah, 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 whatever. Forget all that. Just simply send the exact same email again. It's okay. People get it that everyone's busy. There's so much clutter in our inboxes. The same thing goes with a phone message. Keep at it. Be persistent. No one's going to be upset with you if you've done it two or three times. If you start emailing six, seven, eight times, maybe a different story. But I, everybody, when, whenever you're following up, that's essential. Now, one last thing. If you are simply saying, hey, I was wondering if you thought about what we talked about last week, well, maybe they didn't. Or maybe they did and they didn't really think much of it. So you can't really lead with that. What you need to do is say, oh, over the weekend I was on uh, you know, NewYorkTimes.com or CNN or you know, Fox News and I saw a story about how so-and-so company is expanding into Eastern Europe. And I thought about you and I was curious to know what your position is on that. would love to catch up with you. Bring out something that's tied in with what they do for a living, some reason that connects why you'd be reaching out to them. Because then they'll say, oh, right, yeah, you know what, let's talk some more about that. But, you know, it's interesting. In Eastern Europe, blah, 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 blah. And then let's definitely catch up this week. Let's have a coffee on Tuesday, et cetera. So it's, I, whenever there's a follow-up opportunity, I always like to say bring up something that ties in that person with what they do and then – you know, they will figure out that they realize that they need to follow up with you otherwise. What's your podcast all about? So the podcast is called Make Your Mark, and I like to showcase and highlight people either in the sports industry or athletes, or I also uh, interview veterans. But I like to talk to them about how they're using what they've learned as an athlete or in the sports industry or in the military, and they're using it for positive impact after they've left. So, for example, I've had a few athletes that have either set up charities or they've got uh, other businesses that are doing good out there. I've spoken to um, a variety of uh, media people that also were involved with sports, but now they're doing uh, different things within the, whether it's within the sports industry or outside of it. And the veterans that I've spoken with, uh, one young lady, she's fabulous. Her name is Chelsea Mandelo. She has started a company called Troopster, which basically uh, sends, it allows you to send a package to your uh, loved one. If you've got a uh, um, son or daughter or whoever it is overseas, she takes care of all the mailing of everything, gets it there safe versus sometimes you having to uh, rely on the USPS or et cetera to get something there and it may arrive damaged and so on in the middle of who knows where. Um, it's a great I love what she's doing. So I, a lot of these stories really revolve around somebody that's making a great impact, a positive impact, and it's uh, it's something I just started doing uh, just a few months ago. But I I love doing it. It's it's uh, I get a chance to really shine a light on what other people are doing and not necessarily what I'm doing. But I, I really get a kick out of that, and it's uh, it's really some impressive people. Um, most of them are not necessarily household names, but maybe they should be for what they're doing. And uh, it's uh, you can catch the podcast on any of the major, you know, iTunes and Stitcher and YouTube and so forth. But it's called Make Your Mark. Uh, with that, Mark, we have to uh, call it. Uh, we've, we've been talking with Mark Moyer. Um, uh, your website again for our listeners it is www.markmoyer.com. Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful. 